Well, hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm thrilled to be joined by Christine Brennan, award-winning journalist. Christine, welcome back to the show. Dave, it is great to be on with you. Uh, here we are, another skating season uh, in, the, in the midst of it, in the throes of it, as we are uh, just a couple months now from the Olympics, which is pretty cool. So very exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. The, Tanya Harding is coming back. Every four years, there seems to be a new reason to talk about Tanya and Nancy. But this year is a pretty interesting, exciting one uh, with, the, with the release of I, Tanya. I saw the film about a month ago. I know you've seen the film at least twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is a story you know well. Uh, just to give my initial reaction, um, I thought that I thought as a film, parts of it were great, parts of it were troubling. I thought that the comedic part, obviously, of Alice and Janney playing uh, Sandy, Lavana Harding, was hysterical, and I know that she's been nominated for a bunch of awards. There's a lot of abuse that's troubling, and I heard you speak about that. Uh, I also think that the element of truth in this is a little bit troubling, because as I left the screening of this, there were people that were speaking as though this is the factual account of what happened. So what is your, what do you make of this film? Is there's a lot of artistic expression? Is it low on technical merit, high on artistic expression? <laughs> As a journalist of figure skating, how do you rate this, Christine? Well, I like this. If I can use the old system, I, I hadn't even thought of this. So that I, you're, you're catching a great question. Uh, I think your assessment of the movie is right on. Um, I, I guess, let's see. Well, if the first mark would be the, um, like, truth, facts, you know, things like that, right? Yes. Um, uh, you know, knowing that we're all we're going to be in the fives no matter what, just because yes. that's you know that's uh, we're at the senior level, we're at the Olympic yes. level. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Unless Letitia Hubert shows up, um, uh, I think, um, man, in terms of factual, uh, maybe a five, three, five two, five three, maybe five, okay. you know, something like that. A lot of a lot of things that aren't quite right. We missed the opening combination a little bit. Right. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> yes. And, of course, the triple axel. You know, one of my favorite of the millions of favorite stories about Tanya was when, in, I think it was 94, you know, she was still talking about that her, the triple axel was her most consistent jump. <laughs> and and that was true <laughs> because she was missing it all the time uh, at that point. So it was consistent. Um, the uh, And then on, on the, uh, you know, the second mark, uh, you know, entertaining and, you know, maybe a 5'6", five, 5'7", five, something like that. Um, and I know people say, what, not a 5'9", or, or, but um, no. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, but yeah, so let's, the movie first, Dave, um, before the, uh, um, I guess they're intertwined, the movie and the actual story and the facts of the case and the, and the, uh, the, the incredible, you know, the whack heard around the world now um, almost 24 years ago, which is hard to believe. Um the I, I like the movie. I, I did see it twice. I saw a screener, so it was emailed to me, and I had a chance to watch it uh, and, twice. And um, I, I, there were times I laughed out loud, and I'm sure you had the same. I think you saw it in a theater, correct? Yes. Right. And there were times that I'm sure you did as well. And a lot of those times uh, revolve around the character playing Sean Eckert. Yes. So we, you know, it was like right out of Napoleon Dynamite or something, right? I mean, just... It's just so stupid. So, Have you but, met Sean Eckhart? Pardon me? Have you ever met Sean Eckhart? Uh, no. no. Well, see, all these clowns were around, but, of course, we weren't focusing on them until after, you know, January 6th. So, so much of, I mean, we knew bits about Tanya, but, of course, we weren't covering skating like we do, well, especially in the last, you know, maybe in the Michelle Kwan era. I think it's waned again, of course, in terms of coverage in the mainstream media. But the heyday of skating occurred after Tanya Nancy, and of course that inc- occurred after Tanya in terms of covering her. So, so we knew her. Um, you know, I don't know that I ever met Jeff Galuli. I knew she was married. I didn't know that she was had been divorced. I think we all called him. If you look at clips from the right around the time of the attack, uh, January 6, 1994 onward, I think you'll see a lot of, of, of references to her husband, Jeff Galuli, and of course he was her ex-husband leading to one of the great uh, adjectives of the Tanya Nancy story, live-in ex-husband, yes, only to be to- topped by chain-smoking asthmatic, uh, which is my favorite. But anyway, um, so I, I think uh, the, um, you know, the whole the storyline, um, you know, everything that when you ask about Sean Eckert, uh, you know, I, I know I did not meet him. Uh, and and I don't 
other than the fact you see him like in the Portland airport when Tanya gets off the plane, I, I don't know if he was even, you know, where he was and his whereabouts, but he would not have been credential. You know, we wouldn't have seen him around, um, that kind of thing. So um, I, I, so that is hilarious. So that that moment, and this is not, you know, there's no spoilers uh, involved with this. I think everyone pretty much knows everything that happened. But the, when the FBI is showing up at his door and it's Sean Ecker, and he's, oh no, no, I'm, no, 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 that's not me. And his mom yells out, "Who's at the door, Sean? Or who is it, Sean? You know, you just absolutely laugh out loud stuff." Um, so there, it's very entertaining at times. Uh, I agree with you on the, the nature of it, the troubling uh, aspect of it. The second go round, I actually counted the the uh, incidents of domestic violence, and I may have missed one or two. So I, I don't want to, you know, this is not necessarily um, 100% accurate, but I, it's pretty close. And the times that Tanya is being hit by either her mother, which includes uh, what a hairbrush, uh, a knife. Yeah, well, the knife thing. Yeah, um, there I counted. 13 to, or then being hit by Jeff uh, 13 times in the movie and then I counted seven times that she's hitting Jeff so that would be 20 to altogether and and I'm it's it's around that number I may have missed one or two or you know uh, it's it, it's for me it's too much I think that uh, we of course heard stories uh, from Tanya that she was that she was hit and attacked uh, by by Jeff and uh, beaten up, what have you, and, and that's horrible. And uh, but I think one or two of those episodes in the movie would have gone a long way. I think they would have shown us we get it, and it's not good. So I'm not minimizing domestic violence at all. And anyone who's followed my coverage of Ray Rice and the NFL knows I would never do that. But in the movie, it's just oh my God, you know. Um, now some I guess might say, Dave, well it's true. That's exactly what happened. Well, okay. Um, but it just is it's nonstop and it it can I, I think it detracts from the movie um for me. I, I think again, uh an episode or two, or maybe three, four or five, you know, uh would have I think really uh, gone a long way to to showing the issue and to explaining it and to uh, graphically giving us that view of that part of Tanya and Jeff's life and or Tanya and her mother's life. But um, I'm wondering, and I don't know the answer, and we may never know the answer. I'm wondering, Dave, if it's not done to elicit sympathy uh, yeah. for Tanya, so that you then feel sorry for her for all the other idiotic and ridiculous things that happen. Uh, and at the end, frankly, you know, like, oh, the poor thing, and look at all the abuse she took. And and if that was done, if if the amount of domestic violence, the amount of hitting, the amount of violence you see in this movie was done to elicit sympathy for Tanya, well, then that's certainly fine. They can do whatever they want. It's Hollywood. It's a movie. But that then, to me, is, is uh, factually disingenuous because that's, mm-hmm. um, that is making you feel sorry for someone. Um, and, of course, you know how I feel, that I don't feel sorry for Tanya <laughs> at all. So, um, But, again, it makes me sound like I'm, I'm minimizing domestic violence. I'm not. No. But well, I think that they made – Margot Robbie's character a little bit softer, perhaps, than the actual Tanya. And that's what I wanted to ask you about, because I felt that there's an, they may, definitely made Tanya more of a victim than perhaps she was, even though I agree that the, the violent, domestic violence happened in her life. But I felt that there was an element of Tanya, they took away her strength in the film. And perhaps it was to make her more likable, perhaps it's artistic license, perhaps it's all into the purpose. But when I think of Tanya Harding, I think of a strong, scrappy, hard as nails athlete and I thought that part of that was missing in the character of Tanya and I wonder you know what your perspective on that was I think you're right I think that's a great assessment um I um she's she is a bit softer and more likable than the Tanya Harding that I remember now having said that I actually like Tanya and mm-hmm. I think well I talked to her last uh at the 20th anniversary going into that and she called me back and did an interview and and actually I think I might be the only journalist who got both Nancy and Tanya uh, right around that time, and I did, that was a piece that ended up being on A1 of USA Today um, right at the 20th anniversary uh, four years ago. So so I like Tanya. This is not about not liking Tanya. Um, it's always made me laugh, the ridiculousness of it all. Obviously, uh, when I say I like her, I also believe she was involved in the attack on Nancy Kerrigan much more than just hindering the prosecution. I believe she knew, and that's just from – all the things we know and, and, and some of the things that really I don't think are portrayed that well in the movie, which we can get into. But um, so I don't – obviously that is not appealing. That's horrible. Um, 
and I think it's important to say right up front on on this part of it, Dave, that that think about this. It, these these idiots, these knuckleheads, wanted. There was one point that that Sean Eckert was quoted in some um, some investigative document saying that he or, or interview saying that he that they were hoping maybe even to kill Nancy Kerrigan. They had duct tape her in the her hotel room in Detroit, and there was talk of really injuring her seriously. Now. Also, if they'd actually, if, if Shane Stan had not missed with the retractable police baton and it had missed her knee, but missed, missed the kneecap, and actually had knee, hit her in the kneecap and broken her kneecap, again, this would not be a funny situation at all. I mean, we only can laugh about this story. We only can enjoy this story and the ridiculousness of it because these guys were so inept that they never did the right, they didn't do the right job in attacking Nancy. Thank mm-hmm. goodness they didn't. But I will never stop saying this as long as I am asked, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. that someone was attacked, and it was Nancy Kerrigan. Mm-hmm. And as we giggle about Tanya, and I, we've all done it, I've done it, and we laugh about it, and we enjoy this movie, and oh, yeah, whatever, you you know, never forget that they attacked Nancy Kerrigan and that they they, they wanted to do some severe damage to Nancy, including maybe killing her. And thankfully, they were so screwed up that they failed miserably in doing anything other than uh, creating the most famous bruise in the history of sports and spurring Nancy onto the greatest performance of her life, the silver that I thought should have been a gold in Lillehammer. But but this wouldn't be funny if they weren't so screwed up uh, and if they had done their job. So thankfully, they didn't. Um, so going back to Tanya, and, the, and that, I think your, your assessment is right on, Dave, that, that she is a more appealing character uh, in the film, that Margot Robbie is more appealing than the real Tanya. And I, I noticed this where, and you see it actually then at the end, where they do show the real thing, uh, not only her long program, but then also her uh, coming back to Portland. There, there's this more of a, a, a lightness to her answer when she says, talking about, I want to, you know, I get Nancy, but it will only mean more when I'm, I'm, you know, get a chance to beat Nancy's butt or kick her. Gonna whip her butt. Yes, yeah. there's a strength to that, and it's more flippant in the film. It is, and, and there's a bigger. I, again, now I would, I'm not looking at it now, of course, but to me, when I saw it two, two times, there was more of a smile and more of a friendliness in in Margot Robbie's portrayal of that. And when you see it, which of course we all saw it at the time, and then of course you see this extra, they do show it. It's a stronger more strident and, and nastier uh, way that Tanya actually said it. You know, little things like that, but it does then give you this overall impression. And I will tell you this. So when at, at the end, when, and again, this, I don't think this, uh, can there be spoilers in this story? <laughs> you know, no. Everyone knows this. Uh, but in the end, what the judge is, and of course, the, this is also U.S. figure skating is involved, you know, saying, you're, you know, you're banned from the sport, which is absolutely the right decision. Absolutely. This woman, at the very least, brought these four idiots, these four you know, clowns, into the sport, and they attacked one of her rivals. I mean, that's, that's the minimum that Tanya did. Um, because of her, they were able to attack Nancy, and, and it was you know, just, just horrible. It's horrible. Um, of course, you kick this woman out of the sport forever. So at the end, though, that courtroom scene where she's sad and she goes, throw me in jail, but I want to be able to skate again. Well, you do. I actually found myself, Dave, feeling a like, sorry, right then, watching. I did as like, well. I did yeah, as well. like, oh, that's sad. Well, bravo to everyone at the film for pulling that off. That is a ridiculous emotion for us to feel. And I, I've been asked about it. So I'm going to do some TV interviews and other things on this and as we move ahead. Sure. And believe me, I, will, I, will, I promise you and everyone listening that I will continue uh, to say that, that uh, she should be banned for life and this notion that we're feeling sorry for her. It's, it's really uh, ridiculous. I guess it's Hollywood, but um, but the fact you know facts are facts, and uh, and uh, I don't think we should feel you know uh, there should be one iota of um, of sadness or, or sensitivity for for Tanya in terms of of her career because she has no one to blame but herself for for blowing yeah. that up. I think a lot of people have really conflicted emotions. I was speaking to Sandra Lucko, who did the original documentary on Tanya, and you know, her involvement with Tanya and those feelings. I know she's going to be on 2020 when they air the, the two-hour special in early January. But I wanted to bring you back to when you first meet Tanya because we have to remember that Tanya was originally supposed to win the gold medal at the 1992 Olympics. None of this would have ever happened if between October of 1991 
And February of 1992, Tanya Harding did her job. If Tanya Harding did her job, I think she would have been quite uh, the contender for the Olympics, certainly would have medaled. Uh, of course, we see Tanya Harding win Skate America. She then completely loses her form, barely makes it onto the team. There have been stories that they wanted to yank her from the team and weren't sure. Uh, she has come up with the equipment story that her blade was on incorrectly. Of course, she didn't arrive into the Olympics in Albertville until less than two or three days before. So when did you first meet Tanya Harding? What is your introduction to her? How, you know, how does she come into your orbit? Because at this time, I know that you're at the Washington Post and covering a myriad of sports. Right, exactly. Yeah, um, I first really remember Tanya in 1991, because, and that was at the Minneapolis National Championships, where she landed the triple axle, and that's the long program that you see at the end of the uh, in the film. Um, and that's obviously a big focus of the film, the, the idea of landing that triple axel uh, at the at the nationals. The um, and of course, the first time, the first time ever for a U.S. woman. Uh, before that, I, I covered the '88 Olympics um, in Calgary. I was covering all kinds of things: skiing, um, men's hockey. I was also then uh, covering the Battle of the Bryans and um, and and the Battle of the Carmens. Uh, so I went to several skating events, but I wasn't the only person at the post even covering skating at that point. We, we kind of had um, three or four different people covering a lot of different things. So that was that. Then 90, I went to the Nationals in Salt Lake City just for a couple of days, just dropped in there. And then 91 was when, you know, full bore um, and started covering. And I think just because 91, we were leading to the 92 Olympics. So we, we were going to, uh, you know, I was going to be there the full week at, at, at Minneapolis and, and cover those Nationals. So that was it. And the talk, um, uh, you know, the day days, Leading up to it, I don't think we had conference calls with people on the phone beforehand. I don't remember that anyway. But you get there and you get a, a press conference or two, and, and Tanya Harding's talking about landing the triple axel. And I forget the exact timing, but there was a big piece by Ed Swift in Sports Illustrated about Tanya, and it may have been then or it may have been a little after. But the, you know, once we started to hear a little some of the stories about Tanya, and at the time, uh, Lynn Plage was doing all the uh, a ton of the public relations outside of U.S. <laughs> And Lynn was, uh, was brilliant. She put a judge, Bonnie McLaughlin, uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but Bonnie was a U.S. national judge, and she had a sit. She had her sit with us, with all the media, and there were 30, 40, 50 of us then from newspapers around the country, sit in the midst of us and tell us what the jumps were. Mm-hmm. Well, she would also tell us other stuff. <laughs> And this is when we would start hearing the gossip because Bonnie was terrific and just would tell us things about people. And we we're like, what? And anyway, we'd hear a little bit about Tanya and that she's got this boyfriend or this husband, whatever, and wherever just they were in that relationship at that point. And I guess they were married. And, you know, Jumper, but she lives out in the woods and outside of Portland, Oregon and Washington State. And 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 then, there were, then as I said, Ed Swift wrote this story right around the same time about the uh, altercation with a a fellow motorist where she's got a baseball bat out in the middle of an intersection and and that she could, you know, knew the inside of a car inside and out and, you know, could work under the hood of a car the way no one else could. And, you know, all this kind of stuff that was just really appealing. So for anyone out there who thinks we we despise Tanya or we thought we hated her because she wasn't a cookie-cutter figure skater, oh, my God, it couldn't be further from the truth. We thought she was great, Dave, because Mm. this was just so different. And, again, we knew – so little about the sport compared to the way we know it now because again tanya nancy hasn't happened so we don't have the deep dive into the sport that we've all had since then and so um i don't know that i've ever met tanya i i was sent in press conferences and listened to her maybe said hello that was the extent of it and um yeah so 1991 that week when she lands the triple axel makes history that was the, the week that i really started to pay attention and notice who she was my question is Obviously, you can tell U.S. figure skating now, Lynn Plage, she's not one that likes controversy, and she tries to smooth all of the rough edges. What was the attitude about Tanya? Because, I, you know, I heard you speak a little bit about this, and, and your um, an answer is very clear, and I've thought a lot about this, is that Tanya was never really robbed. I can't think of any competition where she finished lower than she should have, though Tanya will – say otherwise, but, I, you know, looking back, I would say that she was judged pretty fairly throughout the competitions that, you know, we're obviously very familiar with at the national level. What was the attitude about U.S. figure skating? Were they hesitant about her? I mean, it, you know, she paints it that she was the hated uh, 
member of the team, but, you know, in dealing with the officials and Lynn Plage and everyone, what was their attitude towards Tanya at the time? Yeah, well, I, I don't remember anything other than she was just fascinating to us because she did mm-hmm. seem to be different than the other skaters. Mm-hmm. Um, and, again, I say that because we didn't really know much. I mean, we knew we knew about Christiane Magush. We knew about Nancy Kerrigan. Mm-hmm. But, again, we didn't know what we know now about, like, Michelle Kwan. I mean, you just mm-hmm. didn't have, again, that deep dive that you, we've had since Tanya and Nancy. So I, I don't remember – other than hearing from Bonnie McLaughlin, and again, Lynn, brilliant, and I love Lynn, and, and she's you know just uh, you know so so helpful and has been for, throughout my career to um, to do all these wonderful things to facilitate the coverage of the sport. Um, so Lynn just brilliantly put Bonnie McLaughlin among us there as a judge, and we start hearing some of this gossip and and whatever it might be, Nicole Bobeck, you know, um, I, I can't even think of what all the gossip would have been, but as we start hearing it, you know, you're kind of going. Wow, and and Tanya was a, a definite wow. You know, <laughs> really, this all go- okay. Wow, that's fascinating. She's different, but no, I do not. And again, at this point, we're not talking to judges except for Bonnie. You know, we're not. That's the first time anyone I think ever met a judge. Mm-hmm. It, we didn't. Know, I, we're, we're not even sure who the, what their names are at this point. You know, it's it just. I, I know it might be painting a picture that just sounds so different. Um, now, now I have to say that Phil Hirsch and John Powers have been covering this sport in in the eighties. I had not. So they probably knew a little bit more about it than I did. But um, but even then, you know, it was just drop in, write about it a little bit, and then leave, and then move on to other things. So so I think that um, it, if if they just – well, this is a, a, a huge point to make, and I, I'm glad you, you've kind of presented it, because the idea, the notion that we will hear over and over here again in the next month or so is that Tanya was robbed. You know, mm-hmm. Tanya got the shaft. That um, that she didn't get what was due her, that is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm going to write a column at some point. I'm actually also was interviewed for the 2020 thing. I say this over and over again for uh, I'm from ABC for whom I work. Um, uh, and I, I said it. I did talk to them for three hours, so uh, <laughs> that lost the sound bites. Um, that that this idea is, is you said, and then the caller to this um, NPR thing I did the other day. You know, unfair. What event was it? Name the thing that that uh, I asked to this caller. Name the event. Name the moment when she didn't, when she was screwed. When she didn't get what she was due. What what was it? I, you know, Olympic trials in 1992. No, she goes to the Olympics, and you presented the case. She was at her peak in '91. By '92, Christy Yamaguchi's coming on like gangbusters. Nancy is as well, and Tanya is listening to Jeff or whatever, as opposed to Dodie Teachman, uh, who was a very good coach and, and did a nice job with her. Uh, then, of course, you've got the, the Olympics in 94. I mean, she was going to make that no problem because, you know, Michelle Kwan's 13. You're, at that point, Michelle's not yet ready. I mean, she probably would have been fine if she had to be, but you're, you're two people for the Olympics, only two, of course, because Nancy had not done well at the previous world, are going to be Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. Yamaguchi's moved on to Stars on Ice. These two, and talk about luck, being born in 1969, 1970, as those two were, and 71 was when Yamaguchi was born, you had this unbelievable good fortune once ep- once in a lifetime, once ever in the history of the Olympics, to go to the 92 Olympics, and then because several years later, not in, in the parking lot or whatever, as they show in the movie, that several years later they made the decision to then move the Winter Games off of the cycle with the Summer Games and move them to 94. You get two Winter Olympics in two years. That's extraordinary. That is as the greatest luck you could have, and Tanya had that luck. And then, they, put, of course, she's on the 94 Olympic team. She won two national titles. Obviously, they took the second one away, as they should have. Um, what? What? They didn't like her? Are you kidding me? If they don't like her, if they hate her, if they want to keep her away from doing things, they don't send her to the Olympics, and they don't let her win national titles. So that whole premise is absolutely ridiculous, and uh, I'm amused that, uh, that, that it, there's that – that thread out there. I don't know how you'd defend it because you just look at the at her resume and her record and you see what she got to do and and then tell me again exactly how was it? That she <laughs> so I thought about this. I thought about this and the only thing I can think of is that Nancy Kerrigan was being um cashing in uh after the ninety two games the amateur rules had changed and Nancy was earning a lot of money uh to the point where she was doing too many off ice activities and it, and it hurt her results at the ninety three world championships. Tanya, um at that same point was not in shape. So Tanya was not able to capitalize on those things, but Tanya also 
was not able to skate well that season. She wasn't sent to the World Championships. She wasn't in shape. She didn't appear to be training. But there seemed to be a disdain, a jealousy, um, and it seemed to be about money, as the motive often comes back to. Uh, and Nancy was really the poster child of skating at that point. And some of it is, you know, her look at the time and, you know, her image, but were all things that Nancy worked at and the game that was played in figure skating at the time. So I was wondering, as you moved into the 94 Nationals, did everyone still expect Tanya to make the team? What kind of a... What was the buzz? Was she an outsider? Was she likely going to make the team? You know, when you arrived at Detroit, what were your expectations? Well, and and even before that, I think you made a great point about the, the way Nancy was was the one getting the endorsements. But and I know you know this, and you'd say this in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Who was the returning Olympic medalist? Yes, <laughs> Nancy Kerrigan. She won a bronze medal at the Olympics in in, in 1992. So you're a company, right? So let's mm-hmm. you know play this out for just you know a minute just for kicks. So you're a company that wants to have a skater and pay that skater X sum of money, uh, do a commercial, whatever, uh, to um, you know to sponsor and and promote your product, whatever it is, going into the '94 Olympics. All right. So the 1992 Olympics, you've got Christy Yamaguchi. She's no longer in the Olympics, no longer competing. You've got Midori Ito. She's no longer in the Olympics. She's no longer competing. So your next figure skater is your bronze medalist from 92, and that's Nancy Kerrigan. Tanya was fourth. And as we know, Tanya, again, well, the jet lag thing is just one of the classic screw-ups of all time. And that's how, I mean, we should come down hard. Any athlete in any sport who would be that poorly uh, trained and that poorly uh, managed in, in her own life and also let the lack of respect for the sport to show up three days, going from Portland to Lo- to uh, Al- Albertville, and uh, and then say they're not jet-lagged, and then, oh, by the way, she's jet-lagged. I mean, just that utter lack of respect for the sport and her place in it. That's what happened in 92. So Nancy's your bronze medalist. Then Nancy wins the national title in 1993. If you gave me 100 companies mm-hmm. and, and said, okay, who are you going to do, do put your money on? Who, who, who are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to rely on this one? You're going to pick the person who's got that resume as a bronze medal and the national title in 93, moving into 94. So, again, and I know you're not saying this, Dave, but, again, the Tanya apologists and and watching the movie, you know, that, oh, that's, well, Nancy was playing the game and Nancy looked beautiful and Vera Wang dresses and all that stuff. We know Nancy was a feisty Boston tomboy who played hockey with her brothers and a welder's daughter, much more similar to Tanya than she was dissimilar in terms of her background, blue collar all the way. Um, so that idea, you know, that's, that's all that's, that's kind of ridiculousness that it somehow Nancy was rich or the, you know, the chosen one. I, 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 Nancy was the chosen one because Nancy had performed well when it mattered and was the reliable one you wanted to put your money on if you were a corporation. Now, she didn't do well at the world and obviously lost the place, you know, they lost the spot for the U.S. going into the 94 Olympics. But still, compared to Tanya, to your point, who's just kind of off the radar listening to Jeff, you know, in between coaches, and, you know, it's, it's, it's craziness. So, so I do think that's very important because this idea that Nancy got it because of looks or something, and I know you're not saying that, uh, Dave, that's, you know, no, Nancy got it because of her resume, because of her athletic prowess and the ability to think, do the things she did, whereas Tanya was completely unreliable and no company on earth would want to be uh, signed up with someone like that. So going into 94, I remember writing uh, a preview story but before I went up to Detroit I, uh, uh, on the 4th of you know, January, 4th of February, whenever I got there, saying that, you know, it looked like the two spots and it looked like the veterans, Nancy and Tanya, would make the team. Yeah, that, that Michelle Kwan was coming on strong. We'd really noticed her in 93 in Phoenix at the Nationals there. But as, much, as great as Michelle was going to be, I had no idea at the time how great, but you know, you knew she was coming up, an up and comer. But that this would still be the odds would be the, these two veterans who were part of the '92 team would make the '94 team. So that that's how we really looked at it moving into Detroit in '94. Mm-hmm. So, at what point did you suspect Tanya in this whole story? Is at what point? I mean, there's a you know, in the great documentary, The Price of Gold, they talk about Evie Scott World turning to Mary and saying. Tanya Harding had something to do with this. I just know. Uh, and Evie, the great character that he is, uh, <laughs> was correct. 
Um, at what point did you suspect Tanya? Was the I mean, they, people have talked about joking that Tanya was involved, uh, and I'm sure that is a joke that many people may have made, but at what point did, did you seriously start to look at Tanya Harding? I do have to give credit to Mark McDonald, who uh, was then with the Dallas Morning News and was covering the Nationals, uh, as we all were, in Detroit. And within a few minutes in the press room, I remember him yelling out, where was Tanya? (laughs) Where was Tanya during the the attack? And we laughed. We all laughed. But, again, we're laughing because of the history of the baseball bat and and she's married, you know, which was very unusual for these young women and skating at that point, obviously, to be married. And in the unconventional way that she was living her life and, and firing coaches and all the all the you know the rough around the edges stuff, coloring outside the lines that we knew about Tanya. So I remember laughing that off. I, I totally can picture the press room, picture exactly where Mark was, where I was when I heard him say it, as we all laughed in uh, in this relatively big room that we were all in. So that was, of course, January sixth. Then I have to say, you know, we get the police sketch. Um, the, the, what, my story appeared on A1 that day, as I'm sure everyone's stories did. The, this, is, I, I think, is really kind of interesting. My take on it and the lead that I wrote that the Washington Post wanted me, you know, it was my editor I was dealing with, we, we encouraged, we talked about it and decided to go this route with it. I'm sure others did as well, that it was nine months earlier that Monica Sellis had been attacked mm-hmm. uh, and stabbed at, at a uh, – in the um, – you know, in between uh, in the changeover at uh, at a tennis match in Germany uh, by, it turned out, a guy named Gunter Parch, who was um, a fan of Steffi Graf. And so that was nine months earlier. And so here we had another top international female athlete being attacked at a major event, or mm-hmm. at an event. Um, the tennis match, I don't know, wasn't, you know, wasn't a major. But anyway, here you go. So I had... In, I think Monica Sella's name in the first or second paragraph, as I did Nancy's name. You know, obviously Nancy mm-hmm. was attacked. You know, the second attack in nine months against it. That's that was our focus. Isn't that mm-hmm. interesting? Mm-hmm. That, that that was how we looked at it through that prism of, uh, you know, looking back the prism of time, looking back on it, and that was our entire focus. Uh, the attack. So I wasn't thinking Nancy. I wasn't thinking of Tanya or Jeff Gooley at all. Uh, other than the laughing about it and joking about it, not at all. Um, so everything's about this police and you know the sketch, and then of course now comes the long program and Nancy's in, in up in one of the, the boxes at Joe Louis Arena watching and they're saying she's actually going to be okay. So thankfully it was a bruise and the, the guy missed and and she's described him and you know it's a police story basically. Mm-hmm. So then I come back to D.C. come back home and it was probably a you know. Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that. So, you know, almost a week after the attack. And uh, I, I, this, you know, among the many, many things that happened, this certainly is one of the memorable ones for me. Uh, I, uh, my clock radio would wake me up and it had all news on it. And um, so I, it turns on at 7 a.m. or whatever time it came on. And it's the news. And uh, right at the top, the first thing is that the, uh, uh, FBI is investigating the uh, the husband of Tanya Harding, Jeff Gooley, uh, in the attack on in for his role or whatever in the attack on Nancy Kerrigan. And it's one of those moments where I guess it's a cliche to say you just sit up straight in bed and you go like, oh my God. But I did. I sat up straight in bed and said, oh my God. And we were then off and running on the story of our lives. There's never been any sports story like it. There never will be. Anyone who's oh, this is like Tanya Nancy. You know, this is a big deal. No. Not even close. Um, so that was it. So I really have to say that I was keeping an open mind and just assuming we had a, a crime story, mm-hmm. just some random attack um, until until that moment. And then uh, I ended up being in Boston when Nancy returned. I went and about four or five journalists, I think, were allowed to cover that. I, you know, or I think they kept it to a small group. I was one of them. Mm-hmm. Flew up to Boston. I think I'd fly right back for the day, but then uh, had to go out to Portland because the earthquake happened in L.A. and our <laughs> our West Coast person had to go back down to that. So now I'm flying out to Portland with literally, uh, you know, no no clothes, no toothbrush, no nothing except what I'm wearing. And I'm out in Portland for a week and a half covering that, staking out the FBI, ordering pizzas. We're all sitting on the floor, uh, you know, as we're covering that part of the story. Came home for a week to D.C. and then flew to Lillehammer for the month <laughs> to Norway. So, so I've often wonder this, and I love these documentaries because we get to see the footage of the Tanya Harding practice sessions at the mall, and mm-hmm. we see a Christine Brennan 
who actually pushed her way to the very front. There's Connie Chung there. Uh, I believe Diane Sawyer was present. Uh, about 100 journalists from all over the world are watching Tanya practice and having impromptu press conferences at the, mall, at the rink at the mall. So, Christine, how did you all wind up going to practices uh, at this time? How did this all come about, that you all descended on this rink? Clackamas Town Center. Yeah, um, right. So that trip out to Portland also included, in addition to the FBI, going out to several of those practices. And, and uh, I had a rental car. And, and uh, in fact, uh, among many bizarre things that happened, um, I was waiting at the steps of the Benson Hotel, where I was staying, beautiful old hotel, um, and waiting for my car. And another woman was standing there waiting for her car, and we started chatting. And, you know, I'm from D.C., me too. I'm Washington, Washington Post, introduced myself. And she's Sarah Just, a producer for Nightline, and um, we are, you know, continue to talk a little bit. And here come our cars. And she said, you know, we're, we're going to do Nightline next week from D.C. Will you be back? Yes. Um, maybe we could have you on. And that was my first ABC <laughs> appearance, and it was not my last. Uh, hundreds and hundreds later, I laugh, Sarah and I laugh about that all the time. Now she runs the News Hour for PBS. Uh, she's the executive producer, but. Uh, so my you know opportunity to do TV all started from that as well really, and um, but I would then you know we just drove my rental car out there and um, and then the mob scene the craziness uh, we we laughed we giggled it was it was absurd it was it was hilarious it was nuts and um, yeah I know you see it a few times I was actually involved in that documentary for a while and then uh, and then no longer involved for we don't need to get into all those reasons but then I was part of the one the NBC one which I think is journalistically better. Um, and more sound. Phil and I are both in the uh, in Mary Carillo's NBC doc, uh, which if people haven't seen that, it's much more of a balanced story where the ESPN one ended up being much more of a the Tanya story, which um, obviously is <laughs> to me anyway. There's some there's some issues with that, but um, uh, yeah. So there we were, and it was it was you knew. I will say this. So I, I, at this point, I've already been in the business since 1981. So I'm I'm a veteran. And you knew, you just knew this was unlike anything you'd ever seen. So pretty much from the moment that that happened where the word came out that Jeff was being investigated, Jeff Gulley, that you said, you know, we've never seen anything like this. And, um, and you know, A1 of the newspaper, the Washington Post, almost every, you know, every day it seemed like lead, this story led the network news, not just uh, CBS, which was the network of the Olympics then, but NBC, you know, Tom Brokaw, CBS with Dan Rather, and ABC with Peter Jennings. And, and of course, CNN, you know, keep in mind is this is, you know, January, February of 94, and you've got three or four more months before O.J. Simpson and, the, and of course, the tragedy of, you know, two dead bodies. Here was a bruised knee. And uh, so when you think about it, this really was that first big cable story where, and then I was lucky enough to do a lot of CNN work as well then, and everyone wanted to chime in. People were talking, I mean, literally at the water cooler, in the produce section at the grocery store, people should she go? Should she not go? Or would they allow Tanya to go? Not, not. It was an extraordinary time, and uh, and I appreciated every moment of it. I, I guess why I remember it so well because it was just you just knew you were in the midst of something that was just so bizarre and fascinating, and you'd never see anything like it. And I I knew that even at the time, and I uh, I savored it as a journalist because you could still do some really good journalism uh, in the midst of all the ridiculousness. Sure. And, you know, you talk about all of the should Tanya go, should Tanya not go. Obviously, she's allowed to, and, and we, we know what happened there. But there's a similar parallel with should the Russians go, should the Russians not go. And I wanted to ask you your opinion on this, because when the news obviously first came out that Russia was going to be banned uh, for their uh, state-sponsored doping activities, uh, originally it sounded it sounded better than it wound up being. I would say that uh, the artistic uh, – it, it, impression was it was wonderful with the IOC decision, but perhaps the technical merit was not there. And I was wondering, we're going to have a situation where there are they're going to call them the OAR, um, mm -hmm. and I, forget me, I just blanked on, on what that stands Olympic for. Olympic athlete from Russia. It's got a real ring to it, don't you think? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Olympic athlete from Russia. Christine, other than the flag and the anthem, what's the punishment? I'm, I'm not understanding what the real punishment is. Uh, at, at the Olympics here? Well, I think we don't know yet who's going to be allowed in and who's not going to be allowed in. Mm -hmm. So I believe, first of all, all those athletes from Sochi who've been banned, um, mm -hmm. unless they, of course, everyone has an right for arbitration and, and to uh, appeal it, 
Um, but that's what over 25 now have been banned. Now that doesn't mean all of them were going to come back and, and be on the Russian Olympic team in 2018, but they're they're banned. So that is not insignificant. Um, that was a ban banishment that was going on anyway uh, within the uh, various commissions that the IOC is, you know, with the Oswald Commission and um, coming off the McLaren report and obviously the fact that more and more data is coming to um, the fore with with uh, with what what the extent of the Russian doping. So that's it. And I think it they account for what 11 medals. So uh, I think it's important. A little side note that Putin cared. So much about winning the medal count in 2014 in Sochi, and of course they no longer won the medal count. They've dropped like a rock. I think the fourth or fifth now in the uh, standings by losing 11 medals from those athletes that have been banned so far. Uh, so kicked out of you know get got to get rid of your get rid of the Olympic uh, medal from 2014, and then and then they're banned. So uh, I, unless they're all allowed back in, which I find that to be stunning because it sounds like the evidence is pretty pretty strong against them. Whoever those athletes which was going to and was going to try, whoever was going to try to make the 2018 games in Pyeongchang, you know, that's not going to happen. So there's that. Then, I, as I understand it, a panel is going to look at each one. I, is, do you understand that they're all in? I, I don't understand that at all. I, well, I, I my understanding is that throughout the history of the Olympic Games, is that uh, my understanding is that there are not always strong consequences for the Russians. I mean, we obviously. Uh, through the lens of figure skating, um, the judges have gotten away with a lot over the years. Uh, I am a little bit skeptical. Uh, we saw one of their ice dancers originally fail a test, was not able to compete at the 2016 World Championships, and then that was overruled for the next season. Now, will Ekaterina Bobrova be able to compete at these Olympics if that uh, test is overturned? You know, I think I have a lot of questions about yeah. the fairness um, and uh, you know, how, I mean, it's, it's really unthinkable to imagine uh, the Russians not participating in figure skating at the Olympics. Um, but to me, I'm, I'm wondering, is there, is this a strong enough deterrent that the Russians would actually stop doping? Do we have no. any evidence that they have stopped doping? No, no. And you're making great points. I think, I mean, I, I totally agree that there's, if the entire Russian team is at the Olympics and no one is banned, which I don't think is going to be the case because I think, People are banned. Um, and I've talked with uh, sources who are very uh, strongly against Russia and very anti-drug doping. Mm -hmm. And they were very pleased with this initial thing. Now, the key is the panel, and the key is how they start to look at everyone. Um, I never thought the figure skaters were, by themselves were going to be, you know, like Lock, Stock, and Barrel, Dave, the entire figure skating team from Russia going to be banned. I never thought that because um, I'm not, whether they did stuff or not, I, I obviously no idea, um, but I, I think that um, a lot of the concern has been other sports, and I, 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 if they cheated, they should not be there. Uh, if they can prove, I think it is important to be able to say in, in, at, at this, that they're having to prove that they're clean. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a presumption of guilt, and now you've got to presume you're, you've got to prove to us that you're clean by taking tests from around the world, by showing us your, the, the records and all that. So let's see. Let's see how, I know there's, a, there's people out there and the media and friends of ours and others who are like, oh, this is nothing, it's a slap on the wrist. Well, I don't know that yet, and I'm not going to just jump to that conclusion because uh, right now, we, I think as journalists, so first we take a snapshot on the day, and we also analyze and do our best. So that day, that was the news. And um, I do think it's meaningful to not have your, your anthem and to not have your flag. I do. Uh, not have the flag in the opening ceremony. Um, now, would I call them Olympic athletes from Russia, or would I call them um, independent Olympic uh, independent athletes? I would have called them that, if you mm -hmm. ask me. Um, but Olympic athlete from Russia, you know, it's kind of like, hi, my name's Bob. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an embarrassment, and and that's embarrassing. And there's the, the level of embarrassment here. Hopefully, is at least part of the punishment. Um, so I, I think that. Now. Uh, but let's see. I think let's talk in a month and let's see who we start hearing is in or not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that. But I wasn't expecting the figure skaters to necessarily be the first ones that were going to stay banned. You know, I, I didn't expect that at all. Um, but I think there's also um, the, the doubts that are, are, are out there I think will be similar. Uh, and, and we may find there's a lot of back and forth similar to what happened in Rio in swimming. 
you remember Lily King and Yulia Efimova, and that back and forth where she's twice banned, Efimova, uh, mm-hmm. and should not have been allowed to back in the Olympics, but they did put her in. Well, it then was left to Lily King to, uh, when Efimova started to uh, brashly and, and ridiculously, arrogantly, just kind of like, ha-ha, laugh it all off and wag her finger, well, Lily King wagged right back and put her right in her place and beat her. And it was, it was pretty compelling stuff. We may see some of that. You know, where we're, we see athletes stand up and say, okay, this Russian was allowed in. I want to prove to the, to the world that I can beat this Russian. That, those are fascinating stories. Is that the best for sport? Is that the best for the Olympic uh, movement? No. But I'm a, I'm a realist, as you are, and I'm a believer. You know, we, we cover what the hand that is dealt. And so we'll see where it all goes. But I am not yet of the belief that literally every 100% of the Russians are going to be at this at these Olympics. And, um, in fact, I don't think they are because of the banishments that have already occurred. And uh, as far as uh, future, you know, a deterrent, it's, you asked that a very uh, important question. I would have banned them all. I would have, if you said, I get to pick <laughs> and I get to be in charge, I would have banned Russia completely. Mm-hmm. Um, can you imagine the wailing and gnashing of teeth? Well, uh, you yeah. told us before Rio, we, we talked about this a lot, and you told me that Vladimir Putin spent $51 billion to put the Olympics in a resort town in Nowheresville, Russia, and that that would never happen. So I was not expecting that punishment, but I do, I do think that, um, that a total ban probably for the last two Olympics would have been uh, the appropriate punishment for what – for the, the, the fake lab that they had with the mouse holes and, and all of the uh, craziness that went on in Sochi, I, I feel that that would be the appropriate punishment. Obviously, there are athletes that are caught in the middle in this situation, and that is unfortunate. But I think as a deterrent and a punishment, I think that would have uh, met the crime here. Well, I, I agree with you. And um, I, that's why I always said I want they should be kicked out entirely. Mm-hmm. I said that before Rio. I mean, I'm pretty much on the record on this one. And uh, before Rio and then again now, that they should be kicked out because you're going to catch clean athletes one way or the other. Mm-hmm. They're going to be uh, treated unfairly one way or the other. Either it's the clean athletes from everywhere else other than Russia who are being deprived of the opportunity to win a medal. And then, you know, the, the horror, horrible thing is, you know, you finish fourth. And then, oh, a few years later, oh, guess what? You, you know, you, you ended up third. We're going to FedEx your bronze medal. You can open it at your kitchen table. You know, they're deprived of all of that. So that's just horrible. Um, or there are clean athletes in Russia, we presume, who then would be caught up and scooped up in a ban and not allowed to compete. So someone's going, some clean athlete is not going to be treated fairly. And I, at that point, I would say, well, let's let the Russian clean athletes not be treated fairly and ban them all. So, but again, you know, it's interesting because people didn't like Lily King doing what she did. Well, then you, you know, it's it you got to then want a full ban, and now you're, you know, what I'm saying? There's there's a it's there's a lot of gray area, and um, I have been consistent. They should never have been in Rio. They were, well, two thirds of them were the one third the track and field, and that hurt that, that hurt them. And it, it and not having track and field there, that's the marquee event, even if we think swimming and gymnastics are and other sports, but it is for the Olympics, and uh, that's a great, uh, you know, disgrace uh, for Russia to not have been at the, have track and field athletes, except I think one or two, in uh, in Rio. And now the disgrace has occurred already. Um, let's see. And uh, my guess, they, they're going to be yes. Uh, will there be athletes banned from Russia? Yes. So it will not be a full team. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions yet about who's coming, who's not, officials, uh, leaders. Um, and that could create some havoc and chaos for Russia moving forward. And, and the, by the way, this, this is not about just being anti-Russia, although I agree with you. The Lifetime Achievement Award, when they banned all the judges, you know, from 1978 for cheating. It was 78. And, uh, you know, oh, yes, uh, Russia has been pulling fast ones the whole time. And this sounds like a, you know, oh, a typical American saying that. No, the IOC, of course, is not run by Americans. In fact, the IOC really, you know, Stuck it to the U.S. for years. This was a Eurocentric organization making this decision that involves the entire world, not just the United States. So we'll see. 
But I think it's going to be a fascinating story to follow. I'm very excited to follow it and all the machinations and all the decision-making that moves on. But I'm still – some sources feel very strongly that this was a a very strong anti-doping people, Dave, who feel uh, they were pleased to see this initial decision made. So I am not as as negative about it all as, as others. Let's see it play out, and let's see who ends up in Pyeongchang, and we'll we'll be able to talk about it more then, I'm sure. Yeah, now, you always seem to find yourself at the center of drama at the Olympics, Christine. Uh, you had a friend, a swimmer, who uh, went to a gas station uh, in Rio. I'm wondering, you know, where are you keeping your nose to the ground uh, in Rio? Where do you expect um, the story to break? It, it, you seem to you seem to attract it somehow. It, it just <laughs> falls into your lap that I'm at work and we're watching you on CNN uh, 20 times in a day. So at what at where where should we be looking? Are the snowboarders interesting? What what do we need to know? Who are the key athletes? Here? Well, I'm laughing because I had a friend in Rio with Kathy. I think that Ryan Lochte would be the first to tell you that, that we, I would probably be the last person he would pick as a friend. Uh, a very funny line by you. Um, yeah, well, because I have a, a wonderful contract with CNN, uh, as well as, of course, my main thing I do is USA Today, and a terrific, uh, you know, thrilled to be under contract again with USA Today and have written columns since uh, since 97, since the 98 Nagano Games for USA Today. Um, and, uh, and I also do some ABC stuff, too, and not to go through all this alphabet soup, but why you see me on CNN is because, obviously, I'm working for CNN. So we'll see. I mean, uh, I never would in a million years, Dave, have imagined that Ryan Lochte and three other swimmers would end up in a uh, uh, drunken, uh, you know, fight in a, you know, drunken haze at a at a gas station, uh, which, by the way, happened to be like two blocks from my hotel in Rio. I didn't even know it at the time. It was that close. And... Uh, and that that would trigger um, these stories. Although I, once once we started hearing that, um, and I heard early on um, and worked on very hard to get the scoop that um, that Ryan Lochte had made some of this up or all of it up, or cha- was changing a story. Um, the arc of these things, I do go back and think of Tanya Nancy in terms of an arc of a story, and it builds to something. And and in Olympics, especially the second week of an Olympics, where there's maybe interest is waning a little, there's room. There's this kind of vacuum. There's this room for just weird stuff to happen and athletes are finished but they stick around and maybe once they're finished competing they start to you know let their hair down a little and so that gets in the way you know things start going there like like Lochte and those guys the swimmers that can happen but I do think that um uh you know I'll be around figure skating a lot and I think it's going to be fascinating uh we'll see what happens with the team competition you know that's the question of Russia mm-hmm. you know are they are teams allowed in we're you know obviously starting to figure out uh, I would expect they would be, but maybe not. Uh, and the Russian judges, if, assuming they're there, how will they react if there are Russians, even other, from other sports that are not allowed in? Will they take it out, as we know the Russians might, or the, uh, the Russian, you know, the former Soviet republics? I, the, a lot of little storylines there for sure. But um, to me, figure skating never disappoints. Uh, we saw it, of course, with conflicts of interest and in those stories. I was in columns I was able to write after Sotnikova won in. Um, and 2014, we go back to 2002 with, the, of course, Marie Van Lagoon, the French judge, and the Canadian pairs, and the whole that whole thing. So, I think um, figure skating is my best bet for for something to happen, and I hope that that's all that happens. Uh, unless there are some presidential tweets, um, obviously no joking at all. This very serious nature of being 50 miles from the DMZ, and mm-hmm. uh, and the nature of the U.S. relationship with North Korea. But let's hope that these leaders, these adults, act like adults and realize that <laughs> that there are um, uh, v- valuable uh, and wonderful uh, young athletes there, and this is no time to uh, to goof around and, and do some of the things we've seen the last few months. So um, hopefully everyone is safe and sound, and I'm looking forward to covering it, not worried at all yeah. about it. People ask, you know, not at all. But I do think um, let's hope that the figure skating drama might be the biggest drama there because obviously we don't want any, any drama bigger than that, right, One Dave? key question for you about uh, – about the film, and we were talking about how they were originally going to kill Nancy, and I've watched the documentaries. I grew up as a kid with this story. I've read a lot about it, thought a lot about it. And Tanya has changed her story about one key point over the years, which is the one really damning piece of information that we have on Tanya is that she had times that Nancy Kerrigan practiced written down at the Tony Kent Arena, which is, of course, the Tuna Can Arena, on this piece of paper that was found at a dumpster, the FBI had it handwriting tested. It it came up positive. 
in the film, they somehow come up that they were just going to send her death threats. Of course, this doesn't really make sense to me about why she would need the times that Nancy practiced uh, if they were just sending death threats. And I wonder what your understanding of that information is with the writing that they have about Tanya Harding. That bothered me, too. Uh, I, I, I still can't figure out what that's all about because, of course, then you also see in the movie – um, the the video, obviously, in this mm-hmm. mockumentary, uh, this video of uh, Shane Stant moving the car around in the parking lot at uh, Tony Kent or Tony Can, which is seriously like the greatest part of that whole story, uh, the Tony Can Arena. So if they're just sending letters, as the movie tells us they are, and that was news to me. I don't remember anything about letters. I remember that they were going to send uh, Shane Stant and the, the driver, Derek Smith, to go to Cape Cod to the Tony Kent Arena, and that's why, that's why Tanya was getting in touch with, with Paula Naughton, mm-hmm. actually, the, uh, the late judge. And Paula was getting her, you know, Paula had no idea. She's just answering Tanya's questions, as, as I recall the story, and giving Tanya the location of the rink and also, uh, of course, the, the, uh, the times that Nancy practices. So I absolutely agree with you. Again, if that was done to make you feel sympathy for Tanya, well, again, they have every right to do that. It's a movie. Uh, but it's just not right. And also, I hate death threats, Christine, are, are no laughing matter either. Well, no, they're, they're not, but they were going to mail letters, right, that were going to yeah. be in, having death threats. Now, again, this is a different time. Letters mattered a lot more than now. Um, and, of course, Tanya had to call because there's no – there's no Googling to find out the location of of the rink. Um, and so she's she's either, as I remember, she called Paula not, but then they also called the rink. Um, so there was both both events, as I, as I recall. And, again, Paula had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with, with this. She was just answering a phone call, as I recall. But um, the bottom line on this is is that the movie is presenting a picture that I don't recall and don't remember, a, a, a quote-unquote fact or a piece of information that I don't remember at all in this story, and it does have it serves the 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 end result of this this little anecdote as they play it out is that it makes you uh it softens the story that uh and again it makes no sense because the car is there you see that the car's moving and the idiotic thing of moving the car every few minutes to make it look like they're not there or whatever if someone's watching them when of course it would then draw more attention to them which is what the tabloid uh, the guy playing the tabloid journalist says but the the reality is that they went there, and they went there to try to attack Nancy, and then, of course, they missed her, and then they had to go to Detroit. But that, that Tanya knew all about that. So, And that, to me, is the answer. I mean, Tanya made these phone calls, getting this information, giving it to Jeff. Um, she knew. She knew. She had to know. Um, and, they, and the movie glosses over that and sugarcoats that in a way that is that – is, Certainly within their right to do so as, as a movie, uh, but it's it, but it's not you know they're not letting the facts get in the way of a good story there, and I think it's important. And I will promise you, in everything I do, to continue to tell the story as I know it. I was there, and journalistically, you know there there are there the truth is the truth, and um, I don't remember anything about this letter thing. And even then, it doesn't make sense because of the fact that you've got them going there. And Tanya's uh, information is helping them go there, and they were going there for one thing, and that was to attack Nancy Kerrigan. Um, I will say it was pretty funny. The Tooney Can thing has always been just laugh out loud ridiculous that she wrote that down. And they even have in the in the movie, as you know, that little moment where where Jeff is saying like Tooney Can, it, you know, and she goes, "Well, there's fishing there." <laughs> <laughs> What <laughs> on Cape Cod? So yeah, that one that one is really suspect. It's really suspect, yeah. and if it's designed to make you feel sorry to lessen Tanya's involvement, or it's like, oh, it was only letters. Well, uh, you're right. That's still death threats. That's terrible, but that's far different than than physical violence. And again, if that's the overall idea to make you feel better about Tanya, well, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm not falling for it, not one bit. Is Tanya profiting from this film? I don't know. Um, you know, as a consultant, I'm guessing she got paid. I know that Michael Rosenberg uh, is, was her agent and has is, still, is now her agent. Uh, and I like Michael a lot. I've not asked him this question, but Michael is working with Tanya. So if Michael's working with Tanya, my sense is that she's got an agent for some reason. And uh, um, and again, it's a free country. She has every right to profit off of this. Um, 
but it is definitely let's not make a mistake here in thinking that this is some objective view this mm-hmm. is and and just like that ESPN documentary that was far more pro Tanya than I could ever be a part of mm-hmm. uh the um this movie uh you know is not it, it's based on facts and there's certainly some things that they've got right but mm-hmm. i think there's also things that they've just got out and out wrong and if it's done to make you feel better about tanya well then that's certainly uh, worth noting as a journalist and wor- worth pointing out and i promise i will continue to point it out um but yeah tanya has every right to make money on it if she wants to and, and good luck to tanya i mean again i'm it's um but but if Tanya, as I believe Dave knew and was doing that legwork to get information, and they knew she knew that they were sending a hitman to Tony Kent Arena uh, to attack Nancy, um, I, that's my sense is that's exactly what she knew, and that's that's uh, what happened. And if that is the case, as I believe, that is it was reprehensible then, and it's reprehensible now. And no amount of sympathy or feeling good about her or feeling bad because she got hit uh, in some serious and important, obviously, and um, worth discussing domestic violence uh, that allegedly she she uh, that happened to her. Well, then, um, you know, again, um, this is important to bring up and that we should be saying that uh, that, uh, you know, what the facts were. And um, again, with a smile in many ways, because it was as ridiculous and most bizarre story that I have laughed at over the years and and uh, and certainly uh, changed all of our lives and changed my life. <laughs> but uh, but I still I will not shy away from the facts, Dave Lee. So I will promise you that. Yeah. Do you think we'll see Tanya skate at some point over the next year? Well, you know, uh, well that was you know it's interesting because someone asked me that question. Well, it, it's too bad she can't skate. You know that she was banned from the sport, and I said, well, well, she's 47. I mean, yes. what you know, and of course, nothing even then or now um, prevented her from doing her own skating. You know, mm-hmm. she w- couldn't have been in a, a sanctioned event because U.S. Figure Skating kicked her out, as they should have, and, and rightly so. But there's certainly Tanya could have gone on a tour at any point. I actually, you may recall, when she went to West Virginia and actually had her pro debut, and I went over and covered that. And, um, you know, uh, I think a couple of skaters, Tanya Kwiatkowski, I believe, was there, and a few other skaters mm-hmm. did show up, um, and she skated. But she also appeared at a, what, a minor league hockey game in between periods. Mm-hmm. And so she had those opportunities, and no one really cared and wanted to uh, watch it. You know, I think the movie obviously is being uh, received well, mm-hmm. and there are the, uh, already the awards nominations for it, and I'm guessing for sure Academy Award nomination for Alice and Janney and, and maybe for Margot Robbie, I don't know. And pretty loaded women's field, I think. But uh but maybe. And maybe even a movie. Um uh, What is Nancy's take? Is this this has to be a nightmare for her, I would imagine. Uh has yeah. anyone spoken to Nancy about Well I haven't and um and I, I don't plan to. I I don't think she has there's any you know, it's a movie. It's not we have such a scattered um, society and media coming at us every which way. I know you know this. <laughs> Everyone listening to us knows this. Um, I, I, you know, the movie's all opened, and then, and certainly I'm talking about it. People are bringing it up to me, but I don't think it's front and center on everyone's, you know, brain. I think there's so much else going on in the world, and then you've got this three or four weeks now before anyone can really see it mm-hmm. around the country, and. Um, you know, if I were giving Nancy Kerrigan advice, and I'm not, <laughs> I have nothing to do. Uh, I mean, obviously, when I see her, it's always nice to see her and Jerry and what have you. But I would, I would say ignore it. I mean, why would you know? Nancy was attacked. Nancy came back beautifully in a mm-hmm. great comeback and had the performance of her life and lost by one tenth of one point on one judge's scorecard. Uh, lost the gold, gold medal to Oksana Bayul. Uh, Nancy has long since moved on. I remember I asked her um, for the uh, the piece I did for USA Today almost four years ago now. I asked her about if she thinks about Tanya. She said, no, why, why would I? Mm-hmm. Why would she? So, you know, this movie I obviously was uh, involved with writing and about and talking to, uh, uh, for Battle of the Sexes, talking to Billie Jean King and Emma Stone and spending time with mm-hmm. them. So that was four months ago three, four months ago, now this, and, you know, movies come and go. So mm-hmm. I, I I will be very surprised if Nancy Kerrigan says a word. 
and I don't think there's any, you know, we're focused on this right now because we're talking about it, and it's, it's great fun to talk about. But if so many people don't even go to movies anymore, and, uh, you know, the numbers are just way down everywhere, and, and so we'll see. Um, and, I mean, it will be interesting to see how many young people want to go see this because, mm-hmm. you know, it's dark, it, it's, um, it's funny, it's depressing in some ways, uh, a lot of ways. Frankly, I think this is like the perfect movie for the Donald Trump era yeah. because it's like, you know, total screwballs and knuckleheads and, and idiots running around, like, you know, and people complaining and it's not my fault and, you know, all the kind of stuff that we've seen uh, with some of the things we've seen around politics the last year or two. Um, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, this, this story kind of led to reality TV, which led to Donald Trump. And... Um, so, you know, if you love that, I guess maybe you'll love this. I don't know. <laughs> but it certainly seems like a precursor for some of the absolute nonsense and ridiculousness and this kind of um, lack of, I don't know, lack of any sense of, uh, you know, of, of people like, to, you know, taking, you know, Tanya should have easily just explained years ago that I, she blew it and she takes full blame for her career instead of wanting to blame everybody else. Well, that does sound like a theme that we've seen in, other places over the last year or two in our country in a very bizarre way with these tweets and some of the other things that are going on. So I don't know. Um, but maybe it's maybe this is what is the story we deserve. And, again, uh, I, I'll be interested to see if young people go. I'll be interested to see. Uh, right, it's been uh, had opened and had great numbers in its opening week in New York and uh, L.A. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, but I, as far as Nancy, I you know, no idea. I would never – I wouldn't expect her to say a word. Uh, why should she? And uh, – but, you know, I've, I've been surprised before by figure skating. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see Tanya on Dancing with the Stars at this point. We saw Ryan Lockie on Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, Th- that's a good one. There you go. I think, I, I think that, that sounds like that's a great prediction. And, uh, and that's because, yeah, I don't know. Like what's, what kind of skating future, uh, you know. Now, I also I think she's, she's coaching a little bit. And again, it wouldn't be sanctioned coaching, but no one has stopped Tanya from doing things. She just can't do it within the world of U.S. figure skating and uh, and the ISU, and that's as it should be. She should never be allowed back to that. But no one stopped her from doing whatever she wants. And I guess, by all accounts, and I talking to her day four years ago, you know, with a, she has a deck building, uh, she's building decks. I don't know if it's a company or she just does this independently, and painting and stuff like that. And she's got a husband and she's got a son who must be about seven now. So. You know, good for her. I mean, you know, carry on with your life, and uh, uh, but but don't try to have us all tied up in some sympathy for you when, in fact, you were the one that uh, that that did all this, and and you have no one, in my humble opinion, Tanya has no one to blame but herself for uh, the screw ups. You know, I, I think it's important to say two medals were sitting there for her. You, you alluded to that earlier. You know, whether it was the gold in Alberville because Christie was pretty formidable, um, and Midori Ito, of course. Um, uh, they also had a triple axel, and that all became very interesting. But uh, Tanya Harding should have won two Olympic medals, mm-hmm. and she won none. Uh, again, with that luck of her being born right at the time, so then you could have two Olympic Games in two years. So she blew it, and she has it, it no one to blame but herself and anyone who runs around. So, you know, this idea that Tanya, uh, which will probably will gain <laughs> uh, in momentum, that, you know, somehow Tanya you know, got, got shafted, Tanya got a raw deal, and that is, of course, uh, ridiculous, but she should have she should have done much more with that talent at a time when, as a jumper, at a time when jumping uh, a premium was being placed on jumping when they were getting rid of the compulsory school figures in 1990, it was all set up for Tanya Harding, and uh, she really should have done so much more with that career than she did. Well, I am sure that you will be covering all of this in the coming weeks, Christine. So I thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, Dave. Thanks again. <laughs>